Berlin, April 2nd, 1849. A delegation of Germans from across the various kingdoms and states stands before King Friedrich Wilhelm IV of Prussia. They carry with them a proclamation by the German assembly in Frankfurt to take up the crown of a new German empire, thus uniting the German peoples under one ruler. Outside, Berlin still smolders and parts of the city lay in rubble from street violence in the previous year, following popular revolutions across Europe. The old order has wavered, especially following the removal of Metternich in Austria and the end of the French monarchy. But this is not the end of the monarchs in Europe. King Wilhelm stands before the delegation and thanks them. He says he's honored, but cannot accept their offer without the consent of the other German rulers. Later, he writes to a friend in England that he did not want a crown from the gutter, disgraced by the stink of revolution, defiled with dirt and mud. Hello, and welcome back to History in Focus, your one-stop shop for the stuff they didn't teach you in school. This week, we will continue our focus on German unification, briefly discussing the revolutions of 1848 before we get into the second Schleswig-Holstein War. Just remember to give freedom a ring and hit that subscribe button. 30 years had passed since the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Europe had remained in a tenuous but peaceful balance called the Concert of Europe. A creation of Metternich at the Congress of Vienna, the Concert of Europe was the idea that keeping the major European powers from growing too strong was crucial to maintaining the peace. This had the effect of keeping Germany disunited. While the major players were Prussia and the Austrian Empire, Germany had smaller kingdoms such as Hanover and Bavaria, which, were they to be absorbed by one of the major powers, could dynamically shift the balance of power. This combined with a growing sense of nationalism, or the belief in a unified national consciousness of people with a similar ethnic and cultural background, placing that nation above others. This mindset had grown due to both the French Revolution and the societal changes created as a result of Napoleon's conquests across Europe. This threatened to upend a divided Germany and ruin Metternich's carefully crafted balance of power. Therefore, in the eyes of Metternich, it was important to keep Germany disunited. In order to do this, he heavily favored the suppression of free speech and a tighter control of education. However, Prussia was not deterred in working with its neighbors and created the Zollerwein, which was an economic trading zone that encompassed most of the German states, but notably excluded Austria due to the unwillingness to create separate zones for the non-German parts of the empire and the opposition of Metternich. While its impact on unification is debated, there is no doubt that it did lead to greater codependency by the states that did eventually become Germany. The French Revolution of 1848 sparked a series of revolutions across Europe, including in Austria and Prussia. In Austria, Metternich was removed from power, and in Prussia, the people rioted in Berlin demanding a constitution and greater self-government. Other German kingdoms also experienced their own revolutions as well, with renewed calls for the creation of a unified German state. This spawned the creation of the Frankfurt Parliament, which first met in 1848 with the intended goal of creating a unified German state. However, these plans quickly fell apart as Austria and Prussia regained their momentum and stomped out the revolutions. There is much more to 1848 that has already been explained by several excellent YouTubers and podcasters, and I will provide links to those in the description below. This allows us to move forward with our story. The end of the revolutions also brought forth a young Otto von Bismarck to the stage. Bismarck was born in 1815 to a minor noble family in Prussia. A man of wild interests, or lack thereof, in his youth Bismarck served in a number of diplomatic appointments, becoming known as a man of sharp intellect, sharper words, and a sharper mind. Following the death of King Friedrich Wilhelm in 1861, his brother Regent Wilhelm officially became King Wilhelm I of Prussia. Following the deadlock between himself and the Prussian parliament, otherwise known as the Landtag, over military budgets, Wilhelm was convinced to appoint Bismarck as Minister President of Prussia and the Foreign Minister. Days after his appointment, Bismarck appeared before the Landtag, highlighting the importance of a strong military to solve the German question. The position of Prussia in Germany will not be determined by its liberalism, but by its power. Prussia must concentrate its strength and hold it for the favorable moment which has already come and gone several times. Since the treaties of Vienna, our frontiers have been ill-designed for a healthy body politic. 
Not through speeches and majority decisions will the great questions of the day be decided. That was the great mistake of 1848 and 1849, but by Einsen und Blut, or Iron and Blood. So what was the German question? We've mentioned it a few times already in passing, but essentially it was the hypothetical scenario for what a unified Germany would look like. On one hand, you had the idea of Greater Germany, where the Germans would be unified under the Habsburgs and the Austrian Empire. On the other side, you had Lesser Germany, which would be dominated by Prussia and exclude Austria. I'll let you guess which version Bismarck wanted. Bismarck has often been portrayed as a maniacal political genius who carefully orchestrated each step on the path to unification, like a chess grandmaster. Recently, there has been a push to show Bismarck took advantage of circumstances rather than manufacturing the events that led to unification. As with all things, the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle. Regardless, the first step towards unification came with the fate of the duchies of Schleswig and Holstein. These duchies are located on the Jutland Peninsula in Denmark. Prior to 1864, these two duchies were nominally part of the nation of Denmark through a personal union with the King of Denmark. Despite this, the duchies had been a mixed place of German and Danish culture. The two duchies wished to remain forever inseparable under a 1460 treaty. When the King of Denmark died childless in 1863, the throne of the two duchies would have passed to a more German-leading ruler rather than the new King of Denmark. However, Christian IX tried to preempt this by sending a new constitution establishing a shared succession law. The German Confederation protested this as it was a violation of post-1848 treaties and troops marched into Holstein. Bismarck, seeing an opportunity to gain public support against a common foe, pushed for the liberation of Schleswig as well as Holstein. With support from Austria of all nations, the two powers declared war on Denmark. Surprisingly, international reactions to this declaration of war were muffled. Britain, while supportive of the Danish claims, would not commit to a conflict without a continental ally. The French were supportive of the Prussian claims to the annexation of the two duchies. Russia, meanwhile, would not cooperate with Britain following the Crimea War and was actively trying to alter the balance of power in Europe. As a result, Denmark would be left to its own devices. If you enjoyed this week's video, please consider subscribing for future videos. Let us know what you thought in the comments below and what you would like us to cover next.